Okay. Bruchim Aboim. We are now on the uh, 13th lecture of the Pesach Haggadah. And um, we're now up to the, uh, actually, the second cup. And the blessing that we make before the blessing on the wine is, uh, bless you, blessed are you, Lord our God, if the universe redeemed us and redeemed our ancestors from Egypt and enabled us to reach this night that we may eat it at Matz and Mar. So Hashem our God and God of our fathers, bring us also to a future holidays and festivals and peace, gladdened in the rebuilding of our, your city and joyful at your service. There we shall eat of the offerings and the Passover sacrifices, whose blood will gain the sides of your altar for gracious acceptance. We shall then sing a new song of praise to you for our redemption and for the liberation of our souls. Blessed are you, Hashem, who has redeemed us. Well, my apologies, I did not say bruch um, Aboim. Again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, the, um, the blessing begins with the words, Goal alnu v'goal, in Hebrew, who has redeemed us and redeemed our ancestors. So the Abarbanel says, Goalanu is past tense, and Megal is future tense. Past tense about the Egyptian redemption, and future tense for the coming of the Messiah. It says, to bring us to this night, to eat both the matzah and the mar. That in the time of the temple, the entire second part of this blessing referring to the future redemption was not said. It ended with the words, to eat on it, Pesach, Matzah, and Mar. And blessed are you, God, who has redeemed Israel. Again, based on the Elias Haggadah. Then um, we make the blessing, the common blessing you always make, on the wine. And then we, uh, there are those customs that say, that we are prepared to do, fulfill the second cup. And again, that deals with the second form of redemption. Again, we know that there are four, that we're alluding to the four cups, and the fifth of the cup of Elio, which have Asa, that will bring Mashiach, so to speak, bring us to the land, which the, that, that generation did not see. So the fifth cup is the cup that's sent out, called the cup of Elio, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but anyway, we should make the blessing of Burpi Agofen, and just like with the matzah and with the um, wine, the first cup, we lean to the left, and we drink the uh, second cup of wine. After this, uh, the next part is uh, raksa, that we wash our hands. Now, the first time we washed our hands was for dipping the vegetable in salt water. We did not make a blessing. And here we do make a blessing. Again, the al natila uh, shadoyim, the, the uh, taking of the, uh, of the hands, uh, the washing of the hands. Again, that we take the cup, natila. And then we make the blessing we take the three matzahs. Now, what we have is two and a half matzahs because we've broken off a half for the afikoman. So what we have is the top matzah, we call the coin matzah, the middle matzah, which is half, which is the levi matzah, and then the Yisrael matzah. And the one who is leading the, the seder holds all three. He makes the blessing, hamotzi lechem in arts, which is the same blessing that's made any time that we have bread. And uh, then he drops the bottom matzah, the Yisrael matzah, and he makes a second bracha. This is al achilas matzah, on the eating of the matzah. And then um, the custom is to have, again, a kezayas of uh, each, depending upon which custom. Some people hold of the olive size, some hold of a, the, 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 the weight of it, about an ounce which would be at least a half a matzah of each, again, depending upon your custom. Now, what's interesting is that the Arizal had a custom to dip his matzah in salt. And again, not everybody again follows the custom, but it's something that people do. And then after this, um, <clears throat> we now move on to the mar. So the question becomes, why is the mar first? And we eat first the, the we first eat the matzah, which is the food of emuna of belief, and only then can we eat the mar, the bitter herbs, and uh, and have emuna and have faith that even though it is bitter, that it is still good for us. 
again, uh, one of the famous questions, why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is they don't. Again, sometimes things are bitter, but bitter many times winds up being better. Uh, again, it's important. Uh, you learn nothing from success. You learn a whole lot from failure. Uh, that's how a person grows. Now, after that, we have the Korak. So we have Matsumara, and Korak is a sandwich. And uh, we put together the sandwich with the um, matzah and then the mar. And again, there are those that dip it also into the charosis, which is shaken off. And uh, we say that in remembrance of the temple, we do as Hillel did in, the, in temple times, that he would combine the Passover offering, matzah and mar in a sandwich. He had a roast beef sandwich with horseradish on it and uh, ate them together. To fulfill what is written in the Torah, you should eat it with matzahs and bitter herbs. Now, matzah signifies the redemption of the nation of Israel. As Basama says, Mara signifies the downfall of the wicked Egyptians. So the Torah uses the word al, which usually means on or above. This is to teach us that the carbon pestlock, the paschal offering, is to be on and above the matzah and the mara. That is, when the night of the Seder arrives, our primary source of joy should not be the matzah, meaning our own redemption, and neither should it be the mar, the downfall of the Egyptians. Rather, we should be happiest about the fact that when the exodus occurred, the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, was finally able to leave the terrible impurity of Egypt. And that is why the verse in Shemot says that the Korban Pesach is Pesach Lashem, it's an offering for this, not just to God, but for the sake of heaven. This is an important lesson um, during the high holidays. When a person prays, whatever a person asks for, in fact, most prayers are for money. Some are for health, but the, the greatest prayer, all those prayers, all the prayers that we make are usually personal prayers. And the angels that scrutinize the prayers look over them and wonder why we think we have the right to be answered. But what's interesting is if a person focuses his prayers on the Shekhinah, on the divinity of God that is in the Galut with us, and just like here, that when we, when Mashiach will come, when we will be redeemed, then the Shekhinah will be also be redeemed and come out of exile. So if a person's prayers are for the Shekhinah, for the divinity of God so it does not have to suffer in Gaulus, then it automatically answers all our other prayers. It's a blanket over everything. And the angels can't argue with that prayer. So when a person prays for the Shekhinah, it is a great uh, defense, so to speak, for our case to be victorious, uh, to both uh, take care of our needs, but first and foremost, to, to bring the Shekhinah out of Gullus, which is in pain, in Gullus. And then by virtue of that, we are answered at the same time. Now, Now, we have to know that the uh, matzah on Pesach is no mere substitute for bread. It's used as in fulfillment of the commandment and requires a blessing of its own. That's the reason why, in addition to the hamotzi, we also make that blessing. Again, the mora symbolizes the bitterness inflicted by the Egyptians. And the charosis, the um, dish that we make that's primarily apples, nuts, and seasonings, uh, with some wine added. Literally, it's, uh, it's like a potter's clay and resembles the mortar with which our ancestors built the Egyptian cities. Additionally, the apples, nuts, and cinnamon and other ingredients of the charosis are used in the Song of Songs, Shir Hashirim, as symbols of the qualities of the Jewish people. Now, the question that we... Now we so we dip the, the mar in the charosis. Why charosis made with apples? So this alludes to the righteous women of the generation who, um, after Pao's decrees of killing out children, and we know even Amram divorced his wife, who was the leader of the generation. So what the women did is they seduced their husbands under the apple trees and then came back after they were ready to give birth. And they gave birth there under the apple trees because they did not want the Egyptians to take their babies and throw them into the Nile. And they left their children there. And miraculously, the angels came and cared for them until they grew, much like animals, and, and, and they burrowed them into the ground. 
says that the Egyptians actually had wind of this, and they plowed up the fields, but the babies were kept below the level of a plow. In fact, in the Az Yashir, there is a verse that says, Zakhelivian Veil, that at the crossing of the Red Sea, we know that a maidservant saw more than Yecheskel saw when he went up to heaven in the fiery chariot, that these same children that were brought up by the angels, that at, this, at the crossing of the sea, when this great revelation was seen by the nation, these same children lifted their finger and said, Zach Haley, this is the same God I saw as I was growing up. And that's what they were privy to. Now, unlike other fruit trees which first produce their leaves to protect their fruit, and only afterwards sprout their fruit, the apple tree brings out its fruit first, and the protective leaves come out later. And so too the righteous women, even though Paro was killing their children. They had faith that if they gave birth, somehow God would find a way to protect their fruit, which of course is exactly what happened. Now, we dip our slavery and pain into the charosis, which can be broken into the word samach cherus. Samach is like 60, that the freedom of the, of the 600,000 Jews who left Egypt. This is where the numbers came from, from these women who were willing to be mysterious nefesh, again, to put their lives on the line to give the birth to all these children. Now, then we have korach. Korach is the meal, uh, pardon me, the sandwich that we have first, again, as we mentioned before, of uh, mixing the uh, mur with the matzah and then dipping that. Now, after we have uh, korach, what we then do, which is not part of the Haggadah, it's not in here, it's custom for people to have an egg, and the egg is whole, which is an allusion to uh, the first night of the Seder comes out on the same day that Tisha B'Av will come out that year. So it's an allusion to Tisha B'Av, and we know that a mourner, it was one of the things that they eat is a whole egg. It has, it's like their mouth is closed, shaped like a mouth. And this is a sign of, the, of mourning. Also, the egg is, has an interesting characteristic and that the longer you cook it, the harder it gets. And so too the nation of Israel. Our ability to survive among the Gentile nations is only because of the fact of our becoming harder and tougher through the exile. It's nothing short of miraculous that there is a Jew that is alive today. In fact, they tell an interesting story of Frederick the Great, who was a great philosopher. And um, he was debating with his archbishop. And the debate was, can you prove there's a God and the archbishop tried everything that he could do, every, every logic he could find, to convince Frederick, to every, everything he said, Frederick had a counter-argument. Nothing left, the archbishop said, the proof that there's a God in the world is that there's a Jew in the world. And Frederick said, I accept that. And the point becomes is that the fact that we exist at all is nothing short of a miracle. And we then have the meal. And uh, again, in the meal, we don't have anything that is uh, roasted, even though people have somewhat of a roast beef or something, but it means something is put on a spit because the Paschal offering was roasted whole. And uh, that was the way that it was made. So again, if a person makes roast beef, generally there's some water in the pot, so it's not considered to be, even though we call it, it's not a problem with that. Now, after the uh, meal, we then have what's called Safon. Safon, that which was hidden, which alludes to the um, Afikomen. And again, the Afikomen uh, was an allusion to, to it's like a dessert. The last thing that was eaten when the Paschal offering existed, in fact, many people would eat the Korban Chagiga, the festive offering for the meal. And then they would set, give out the, again, to be a, a year old lamb. So it wouldn't be a lot of meat. And you could have 60 people, all the family together. And everybody had to have a gazayas, about an ounce of the Paschal offering. And again, you couldn't break a bone on it. And there are different things. But today, of course, we don't have it. So we end our <clears throat> Seder with this Afi Komen. And that's in lieu of the Paschal offering. It's the last thing you're supposed to eat. We will still have two cups of wine. But that's the end of eating, and a person should have it by chatzos, by midnight in uh, 
the Western Hemisphere here in the United States where we are, um, generally in, in, the Eastern, in Eastern time zones, around 1.30 in the morning. And then, and again, you check wherever you are. But it has to be, again, now it's called midnight, but it's really the middle of the night whenever that comes out. Now, one needs to, and then, then, we, then after that we do Baruch, which is the uh, blessing, uh, the grace after meal, the Birchat HaMazon. Now recognize there are two types of blessings in life. Those that we can clearly see, and those that, that we remain unaware of. And remember to thank God not only for the revealed blessings and miracles, but for the Tzafon, those that are hidden in Baruch, for the birth ones that are again obvious and then soft on those that are hidden. The hidden blessings as well, a person needs to praise God for. In fact, we say in the modem that we thank God uh, for all the blessings that he does for us morning, noon, and evening. Because the truth of the matter is, God's constantly doing blessings. We don't even know. Uh, protecting us from perils. Sometimes a person goes late to work and doesn't realize he had gone on time, something would have happened because there an accident or whatever. A person does this, a person does that. And again, you don't even realize that God's helping you many times. Um, also, the, the word soften, hidden. The afikoman was hidden by the young children. And they now bring it to receive a reward. Again, it keeps them awake, uh, looking for this reward that they have. And so too is our relationship with God, our forefather, our Father in heaven. That uh, it may be hidden, we come to him also, the reward on this night. Now, the Yerushalmi states that we eat the Korban Pesach, the Afi Komen, at the end of the meal, because if we were to eat it earlier, we were still hungry, we might come to break the bones in order to suck out the marrow, which is a Torah violation. Also, so that the taste of the Afi Komen, the Paschal offering, so to speak, should stay in our mouths based on the Elias uh, Haggadah. Now, we continue with the uh, Shir HaMalos, which is done at any holiday or Shabbat, pre precedes the Birchat HaMozam. And we say the words in the, uh, we finish off with the words this is of Shir HaMalos, which um, is Psalm 126 in Tehillim. And uh, we say, Bo Yav of Arena no Se'alu Mosav, that um, he shall come home with joy bearing his sheaves. Now, Bo is Bez Alf, that when a boy reaches the age of 13, Yavo, which has a numerical value of 13, so Bo means come, Yavo, which has a numerical value of 13, then his father rejoices, Barina, with joy, because now, no se alumosav, he is responsible for his own deeds based on a Belzer Rebbe. Again, there's a great joy. We believe that a child can be punished for a parent's misdeeds until he becomes an adult in Torah for a girl 12 and a boy 13. So when a child becomes, a boy becomes 13, there's a great joy for the father to know he now stands on his own merits. And there's an interesting uh, story, the Afi Komen. Ashkenazim just eat it, and that's really the end of it. I ran into an interesting custom seems that the uh, Sephardim save a piece, that they see it as a school, as a protection for the rest of the year. And as much as they, we eat the Afikoman, they save a piece. There's a story told of a famous Jew who lived in the uh, 1800s, uh, Sir Moses Montefiore. Sir Moses Montefiore uh, was married to a, a uh, his wife's name was Judith. And she was related to the Rothschilds. Um, Montefiore was uh, 19 when he became a stockbroker. He was only one of 12 Jewish stockbrokers in England. And um, he became very successful, again, with his relationship with the Rothschilds, which is a story for itself. But he was able to retire at the age of 40. And he lived to the age of 101. And he spent his life very philanthropically. And he would take care, he became, had great influence all over Europe. And wherever he could, he would help Jews in their dealings with the governments. And he was very influential and very beneficial to the Jewish community at large. Um, his, he had a great love, he and his wife, for Eretz Yisrael. And uh, they took a trip uh, to Eretz Yisrael 
in, uh, I believe it was 1827. And on the trip, it took them 10 months to get to Eretz Yisrael. And they were only there for less than a week. And there's a famous windmill that is in Yerushalayim that the Montefiore made there. Now, on the trip, part of the trip, they had to take a ship from Malta to Alexandria. And as they were on the sea, a storm broke out. And the Montefiores were huddled in their cab cabin, saying to Hillam. Again, the ship was rocking viciously in the, in the sea. And the captain knocked on their door. And when they opened, he said, I want to appraise you with the situation. He says, we are really in serious danger. Uh, you're obviously deeply religious people. So I implore of you that uh, now is the time for you to pray. That's, things are very serious. A little, bit, a, little bit, a little bit while longer, the captain knocks on the door a second time and said the situation had even worsened. And the waves were soon, will soon overwhelm us and the pumps cannot cope with the water that's coming over the, onto the ship itself. And he left. And again, you can imagine, they began to say to him even with more fervor than they had the first time. Finally, there was a third time knock, the captain knocked on the door. And he said to them, there's really no hope. You must prepare yourself for the end. The ship is about to sink. And Lady Judith, Judith struck with an idea that, again, based on the custom that the Sephardim have, that they save a piece of Afi Komen, that she had brought it along with them on the trip. And she found the piece of Afi Komen in her, in her baggage. And she took the matzah and went up to the deck. And into the wind, she threw this piece of matzah. And within minutes, the wind subsided and the waves lost their fervor. And the clouds dispersed, and very shortly the moon appeared, and the sea was calm. Now, this seems to be something that would be a wives' tale. But this was written in a mogzer that she had. She had a very nice penmanship. And she wrote this, and she said that I'm writing this on the deck of the ship. And as you can see, that my handwriting is very steady with no tremor and that the sea is perfectly calm. And this was a testimony to the event that happened. And uh, after this happened, the captain came and thanked them for saving them. And again, you know, this matzah, this afikoman, again, uh, the great miracles that God does for his children, especially, again, uh, Sir Moses Montefiore and his wife Judith. With this, uh, we uh, begin the uh, benching and again, the benching will, at the end, will be the third cup whenever we have, uh, we bench, especially with a mezuman of 10, but even with three, many people have the custom to bench on a, on a cup of wine. So here that the third cup is not unusual in that regard. Um, what's interesting is that uh, there's a question as to who wrote the Birchat HaMazon. Out of all the blessings that we say, the only one that's actually Torahic is the blessing of the Birchat Hamazon, the, the grace after meal. And um, the Pasuk says, V'yachalta v'savata, when you eat and be saved, v'yachalta v'sham l'kecha, you should bless the Lord your God. That's where it comes from. All of the blessings that we make are really rabbinic in nature. Uh, if you would imagine a man, the, the richest man in the world, self-made has everything. If he's that smart to have to be able to achieve that, he would also be astute enough, smart enough to realize that no one could give him a present because he has everything. <clears throat> so what he might want to do so that people can show their appreciation to him and allow them to give also is to hint at something that he might want and leave it open for them to have the joy of giving to him as well. That allowing someone to give is as much a gift as is giving. So when God Almighty said that when we have a meal, when we have bread, that we should bless him, the rabbis took this as a hint by God that if God wants us to bless him after we've had a meal, afterwards, 
if he wants us to say thank you, you know, he probably wouldn't mind if we said please. And that's the blessing before the meal. And if he really wants us to do that after we have bread, I bet you if we had cake or something a little more substantial, he'd like that too. And this is where the whole idea of blessings before, of please, and afterwards thank you originated. God opening a door and us filling it through what the rabbis, the sages have taught us. And that's why all the blessings that we say are rabbinic in nature. And that's why if you're not sure if you made a blessing, you do not repeat it because we're always lenient when it comes to rabbinic ordinations. On the other hand, <laughs> you'd have to be out to lunch, but someone wasn't sure if he benched, then that you would repeat because it's Torahic when it comes to a Torahic ordination. Then we are stringent and a person would repeat it. But again, there are different sections of the, of the grace after meal, the Birchat HaMazon. So who wrote it is the question. So the Shach says that uh, the gematria of Moshe Rabbeinu and um, Yoshua is the uh, 730, which is the same as the, uh, the Balaturim says, is the same as the, uh, the Bricha Tamazon. So they're the ones that wrote. Now Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the first blessing, and Yoshua the second. There are those who say, and then the third blessing was written by the Bonei Rabbi Shalayim Amein, by Shlomo Melech. And the fourth blessing that we say after that was after they were allowed to bury the dead, Hatovi Ametiv, that were killed in Betar, after the destruction of the, of the second temple. Now, the... Um, so the so again so the um, it says who knows saying lechem lechal baser in the first blessing who gives bread to all f flesh. Now the more Antina states that God keeps the key of parnasa of livelihood for Himself, even though He uses angels for most of His tasks. The reason being that angels would only give sustenance to those who deserve it, and God in His mercy sustains all people, even those that do not deserve it, based on a riff. And the second blessing, it says, and on, the, and on the treaty that we cut into our flesh, again, which is the circumcision, that Mila, circumcision, is connected with the Exodus because it was one of the two mitzvos, commandments, that gave the nation is the merit to be redeemed. That blood was also put on the doorposts based in the Eish Ladaber, that uh, we say, but a maya chayit, a bris, twice, by your blood you live, by your blood you live. So not only was the blood of the paschal offering put on the doorpost, but also the blood of circumcision, both were there. And again, so we, um, that we do the birchat, we do the birchat amazon, the blessing, the same way that we do, we make the insert, again, for uh, the holiday, yan chiliom shalotov, the compassion would cause us to heart today, which is altogether good. There are those that say that, uh, in parentheses, that everlasting day, the day when the just will sit with their crowns on their head, enjoying the reflection of God's majesty, and may our portion be with them. This is the description of uh, the uh, Olam Haba, the world to come. That Sadiqim, the righteous, will sit with crowns on their head, and they will bask in the ray of the divinity of God. And again, we ask that our portion should be with them. Then it um, finishes with the word, with the prayer of Yeru, as Hashem, again, Kedoshav, that we ask God that those who fear him should have no deprivation. And Dershi Hashem lo Yachshu Kotov, those that seek out God should uh, have no, la no lack of good. So it's not necessarily because they have wealth and luxuries, but because they are Sameach Bechelko happy with what they have based on Rav Shrutkin. And that's the key. The truth of the matter is, it's sad people don't seem to know it, but the best things in life are free. Good friends, good wife, good children, um, peace of mind. Uh, money brings about problems for people. They have things to watch. They have more baggage to carry. A person travels light. It's much easier. On the other hand, not having enough is a problem. There's no question about it. But a person needs to know that if you're happy with what you have, trying to get more does not always make people happier. It generally make, many times makes them slaves to their money.
And even though they think they've gained something, the truth is they don't have time to dive and they don't have time to learn. And many times people get vacation homes and all of a sudden where they used to go to shul, they're not going to shul anymore. So that which seemed to be an advantage many times becomes a disadvantage even though they don't know it. But they've been bought off by the Eight Sahara. Anyways, so I think what we'll do is stop here. And next week we'll continue with the uh, second part of the halal, drinking the third cup of wine. And again, some ideas about all of that. Uh, God bless you all. Have a good Shabbos. And again, thank you for coming.